Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Would you take your Bibles and open them to... 2 Kings chapter 7 and Psalm 37. 2 Kings chapter 7 and Psalm 37 as we find the children of Israel under the leadership of King Jehoram face a great crisis. A famine has hit the land. And famines were catastrophic events. I think the closest thing that we could come to in understanding this is when a hurricane comes in uh, on, you know, in Florida and they just wipe out all the food. There's nothing available in the stores and everything is wiped out and you go in to shop and there's just nothing left. Imagine that happening on a national scale when there's nothing available. And in this particular famine, inflation was skyrocketing. The price for things, as we saw in our last chapter, was outrageous and it got so bad that they began to participate in cannibalism. And it was an unfortunate thing that even was predicted in Scripture that would happen. But Elisha is, this is all happening with the backdrop of Elisha, the man of God, this man of faith, who was given insight into the spiritual realm that no matter what was happening in the physical realm, he was so close in his relationship with God that he could see things that others couldn't see. And he could hear things that others couldn't hear that came directly from God. And notice in verse 1 of chapter 7, Elisha says, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, Tomorrow, about this time, a seah of flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Now, Elisha in great boldness speaks on behalf of God. Notice how it opens up. It says, Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Now, anytime you have a man of God, for example, in a Bible study like this, we open the Bible, and when we read the Bible, this is exactly what's happening. Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the word of the Lord. We would do well when someone opens the Bible and starts speaking the word to it, to listen and to receive. And if you happen to be walking in the Spirit, or you happen to be in a place of great faith, you're going to receive. And Elisha, with great boldness, says, I have a word for you. I have a word from the Lord. It is directly from God. This this is what God says. Tomorrow, food is going to be available miraculously. Prices will drop dramatically. And it will be a time of rejoicing. Now, if you're in the time of famine and you're hungry and it is crisis time and a man of God comes and declares that it's going to get better, you're really faced with one of two options, aren't you? The first option is you respond in faith and you say, praise the Lord, we've been waiting for this. Or you could even say, we've been praying for this. Or you can respond like this officer here. And this officer responds with great skepticism at the word of God. He's skeptical. He has his reasons for unbelief. It's everything that he sees. And it's everything that he experiences. And it's the empty shelves and it's the high prices, and it's the cannibalism, it's the difficulty. He has his reasons for unbelief. But Elisha strongly affirms that the word that he gave will come to pass, but he will not experience it. He won't get to enjoy it. Now I have to say there are those times in our lives when we are met with skepticism when sharing the truth surrounding God. We live in a skeptical anti-God society, not very interested in the things of God, offended at the message of the gospel, even pushing back very hard against us. 
And probably the thing that we hear the most when we begin to speak about the things of God, especially in our own lives, is people have a tendency to try to make fun and make light of the work of God. Oh, that you've chosen to live that way, but don't you, that's old fashioned. Or you've chosen to believe the Bible, but that's an antiquated book that was just written by men. And here we are tonight, now, gathered together, listening in on the radio, watching live on a, on a video screen somewhere, in an environment of faith, and an environment of expectation, and an environment of hope and worship. Some you've come specifically during the middle of the week because you, you want to hear from God, you need to be encouraged by God, you need to pull yourself out of your current situation, gather together with other saints. You've come, some of you come to sing tonight with others. Some of you have come just to pray with others. Some of you have come to, to get a time of refuge and posture yourself in a place of readiness and reception. But the world in which we live and the world in which we work and the world in which we shop and the world where we consume their media and we live among this world is not like this place of reception. I know you don't need me to tell you that, but it's good to be reminded that it's not odd that you see that and experience that and just wonder why you seem not to fit in this current world. Why is it that you seem not to fit in? Why is it that you don't think certain jokes are so funny? Why is it that you don't want to take advantage of your boss? Why is it that you feel like you're a, a stranger? Even though the Bible does declare you're a stranger. So what happens? You live day after day, week after week, neighbors, work, bills, fixing the car, and pressures, and, and on and on the list goes. And then we come out of the world for a few moments to be in a place of reception. You know, the world in which we live is anti-God, but it's not anything new. It's not anything new when it comes to the things of God. Jot it down in John chapter 16, verse 1. It says, these things I've spoken to you. Jesus is speaking and he says, these things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. The time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he's offering God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I've told you that when the time comes you may remember that I told you of them and these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. This is a common occurrence in every generation. And herein lies this tension in this hostile environment that we live in. Herein lies one of the main reasons why you're not so vocal about your relationship with Jesus Christ. The reason why you don't take the opportunities that God gives to you and actually becomes a habitual avoidance of entering, of entering in the, into the conversation with the hope of Jesus Christ, it's because you fear people. And because you don't want to deal with any more drama than you already have in your life. <laughs> You know, and so you know, you've got this option of whether I'm going to, hey, you know, somebody's saying some nonsensical thing in the office and, and you know, the Lord just kind of impresses upon you. No, 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 this is actually the reality. But then in that moment that God impresses upon you, you talk yourself out of it and you hear the word of the Lord, you read the word of the Lord, you get prompted to share the word of the Lord and then you're, you're taken back by fear or you're taken back by just protecting even a small little part of your life with comfort. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, it says, fearing people is a dangerous trap. Or in the New King James, it says what? The fear of man is a snare. But to trust in the Lord means safety. And I believe as we walk through our fears and taking the steps of faith of sharing the truth and love, encouraging others, sharing what God is doing in your life becomes easier even if it is met with sacrifice and res with, with resistance, your sacrifice, your stepping in by faith, the good news is that you shared and you were honorable to God and you're not responsible for the outcome. And so what's, what is it to share a little more drama? Why is it that we're so skeptical? Why is it that we're so fearful? Why is it that when we have the word of God that's very plain before us that, that we receive it with such skepticism on a personal level. Because we don't, only, we don't only just learn about this 
sense of Elisha moving forward in boldness, but there's something else we learn from this officer. And, and he's so skeptical. Now, of course, the environment with the king and the leadership of Israel, it's not an environment of faith. And, and that's where, you know, breaking into this theme of backsliding and not being around other believers. And remember, I was just thinking, I've been meditating on this for the last three or four days uh, since this weekend. And that is, if you're in the wrong place with the wrong people, you're going to do the wrong thing at the wrong time. It just has so resonated with me. It's such, it's such the, the target and such the point in so many people's lives. And so if you're not in the, with the right people and you're not with people that are encouraging you and building you up and, and not to remove yourself from the world, that, that's, not God's, that's not what he advocates. He, Paul, Paul said, when I wrote to you guys things, I didn't tell you that you should leave the world, but that you should be careful who you're hanging out with. It, you should be careful who's speaking into your life. You should be careful of wh- where you're gaining, what kind of fellowship you're gaining. You should be careful and to walk in the wisdom of God. And skepticism, where does that come from in a true believer? You could even ask the question for you today. You could say to God, God, why am I so skeptical? Why does skepticism undermine my faith? And here's the problem. The problem with this man is that when he heard of God's great power and promise, he relied on his own mind to try to figure out if it was really possible or not. When he heard of God's, this was a miraculous provision of God. And when he heard of the miraculous provision of God, he began to think it through and try to figure it out. And he thought, notice in verse two, even if he, so in his mind, the only way that God could solve the famine is if he opened up windows in heaven and dropped food down like like a big drop, an airdrop. And so what does he say? Even if God opened up the heavens and he dropped food like a big airdrop, it wouldn't happen. I mean, even if God did that, it wouldn't happen. How could it be? And he answered the promise of God with a question limiting God by his own mind. And I have to think that there are those listening to me that have done the same thing. Limiting God to our own resources, our own mind, if we could figure it out. And here's what it looks like. When a problem arises in our lives, the first thing we tend to do is try to figure out possible solutions to the problem. So we work this angle, we work this angle, and we start thinking through, well, what if this happens? And what if I try this? And try to get out of the problem. But there are a couple of challenges with that. First of all, when we enter into a problem trying to figure it out, when then we take our prayer life and we take that thought process into our prayer life, our prayers become direction-type prayers to God. And you say, Ed, what do you mean? Well, when we pray, we start telling God how to figure it out because we've already figured it out. You know, God, if you would just do this, can you just make this happen? Because I know that if you make this happen, then this will happen and this will happen and you'll solve the problem. And we start telling God what to do in our prayer life. Anybody amen that? I don't hear many amens. Anybody familiar with that? I mean, it may not be as direct as I just shared it, but I mean, come on. We come to God, we've got it all figured out, and if he just works this one out, and if you just take care of this little, you know, that's a problem at work. And so you start praying, well, well, Lord, you know, I did this and I did this, so if you'll handle this and you'll take this, and I go into my boss, and God, just would you make it happen? And we begin to pray directing God. And haven't we learned by now that God does not follow our directions? He doesn't follow our directions. And this is what happens next. So when you have gone through a series of directional prayers and God doesn't answer the prayers that you've been praying, you get mad at God for not doing what you told him to do. And it's a subtle shift, but an important one, as you begin to turn on God and you respond to God with selfish impatience, starting to accuse him of not hearing and not responding and not caring, and not answering, and not helping, and not loving. God, you just don't love me. You don't care about me. You've forgotten me. And we begin to speak. We're not just skeptical anymore. We've become anti-God in this problem. We've become an accuser of God. We have become, we, we have reduced our lives in that moment to the level of the enemy. He's the accuser of the brethren. And who are we to bring a railing accusation against God? Because he didn't answer our directional prayers? Because he didn't come through the way we wanted him to come through? Because he didn't do what we wanted him to do? 
the way we wanted him to do it, in the time that he wa- we wanted him to do it, and then suddenly, out of the blue, as we're in this moment, out of the great grace and mercy of God, just out of the blue, unexpectedly, God begins to work. And he answers our prayer. And he answers it in a way that we never had, would have, we've never thought of. It didn't cross our mind. It wasn't even on our radar. And then his faithfulness shines through. And his answers come. Because we don't have all the facts. And we don't have all the resources. And God is able to do things that we can't even imagine in ways that would have never crossed our minds. He has more resources than we do. He has more wisdom than we do. He has more facts than we do. And we would do well not to come to God with directional prayers, but rather to come to God and just lay the situation before him. Just lay it before him, Lord. This is what I see. This is what I feel. This is what I'm going through. How is it, Lord, that you're going to take care of the problem that I'm in? That's where Psalm 37 comes in. One of my favorite psalms. One of my favorite encouragements in times of difficulty. One of the ways that I can come to and be reminded not to come to God and direct him and boss him around, but rather to surrender my situation to him, to trust him in my life. That that I come and say, Father, I need help. Please intercede. Please solve this. Please reveal to me. And so what does the Bible say in Psalm 31, verse 37, verse 1? Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither like the green herb. And notice all these directions. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. I just noticed as I'm reading this, I started smiling. How can you not smile at this? Just delight yourself in the Lord. Just enjoy him. Feed on his faithfulness. Isn't it in times of problems? And it isn't in times of directing God and being a little disappointed with God that isn't it those times where you forget his faithfulness and his goodness? You just think, man, how do you even have the power and the strength to pray to him? How is it that you're even in relationship with him? How is it that your heart is beating right now? How is it that you're taking your next breath? How is it that you just put down a sandwich or finished it? How is it that you're drinking tea? It's the faithfulness of God. Why is it that he even hears us? He's not obligated to answer us. And yet he does. Commit your way, verse 5, to the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. He'll bring forth your righteousness as the light. And your justice as the noonday. Notice verse 7. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. Why? It only causes harm. It's the answer to skepticism. And you go through in any of these directions. There's quite a few of them in there. Quite a few verbs that speak to us of action in times of difficulty. Don't fret. Trust in the Lord. Come back now as we pick up in verse 3, making amazing progress. But it's just so encouraging. I couldn't couldn't just get past the sense of this skepticism because I think if we would go home and look in the mirror, we would see a lot of skepticism toward God in our hearts. We would see a lot of skepticism in our lives and in our minds. You know, for example, we have this short-term mission team up here sharing of the uh, wonderful work that God did through them, sharing how exciting, and I wonder, I always wonder, I wonder who's listening or watching that the Lord said, go on that trip, but in skepticism, you didn't go on that trip. And it's not that God's condemning you, and it's not because there'll be opportunities, but it is God that he's revealing to you Man, the answer to the word of God is not skepticism, it's faithful obedience. And when he says something that even blows your mind, even if the windows of heaven, well, look, God's not going to, he's not bound by your idea. He's not bound by your resource. He's not bound by how you think you can figure things out. He's not bound by me. 
He's so much bigger and greater and grander and smarter and wiser and more powerful and, and so much, he's so much more than you and me. And when I trust him, all of his resources become my resources. But I have to trust him, don't I? To do his will, his way, in his timing. And that's just that place of rest. Now in the midst of this, verse 3, it says, Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we'll enter the city and the famine is in the city, we'll die there. If we sit here, we'll die also. Now therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we'll live. If they kill us, we'll die. And they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of the chariots and the noise of the horses and the noise of a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore, verse 7, they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. And when these lepers came to the outskirts of the camp, they went into one tent and ate and drank and carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came back and entered another tent and carried some from there also and went and hid it. Now these lepers would have had to live they, the famine would have hit them extremely hard because they couldn't live in the city and they would only receive, because leprosy was a, a, an unclean sickness so they couldn't be around people, so they'd have to live around, outside of the city and they would be dependent on whatever food would be thrown over the gate so they, they, there's no food to be, they would hit them double. So there they are sitting there thinking, look, as we examine our lives, they basically came to the conclusion that it's true, they're going to die. They just started to look. The, the, the famine's so hard. They haven't heard Elisha. They haven't heard that revelation yet. They haven't heard the word of the Lord. And they're sitting there examining their life. And they've come to the conclusion, hey, whatever we do, we're going to die. So if we sit around and do nothing, we're going to die. But you know, if we get up and we step out on faith and we go check out the Syrian camp and just cast our lot with the enemy and just, hey, man, maybe they'll give us a few food, a little, a little bit of food. Hey, it doesn't matter. If they want to feed us, great. They want to kill us, great, we're going to die anyway. And really what the essence of this is, is the, these men have assessed their life and chosen to step out in faith. When's the last time you assessed your life and have chosen to step out in faith and to put it all on the line? They've come to the place where they put it all on the line. This is their lives. Their existence is already hard and difficult. And yet as they examine this, they're like, hey, Let's venture out. And they do. They venture out and find out that the Syrians aren't there. And they left everything behind. Food, clothing, possessions. It's a, it's a jackpot. And they're amazed. And it says right there, they ate, verse 8, they ate and drank. And they carried away silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. And came back and entered another tent and got some more stuff. I mean, can you imagine? It's just like, they're the only four dudes in the whole camp. Hey, look what I found. Hey, look what I found. Verse 9. Then they said to one another, Ah, uh, we're not, what we're doing is not right. What do you mean what you're doing not right? This day is a day of good news, but we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeeper of the city and told them, saying, We went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly, no one was there. Not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. And the gatekeepers called out, and they told it to the king's household inside. And then the king arose in the night and said to his servants, Let me now tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are hungry, therefore they've gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. And verse 12 tells us why his servant was so skeptical. Because this king was faithless. And when you hang out with faith, faithless people, that's what you're going to become. I mean, this is a tremendous testimony. They, these are, they, these left, they took their own lives into their hands again to go tell the king. And they come and share everything and what happens to the king? No way, this is a trap. It's not true. 
just like his servant. The king is walking in faithless failure here, which is to be expected. Don't forget the backdrop of our, our isolated insights in the life of Elisha is a faithless leadership and a faithless nation that's turned their back on God. And it shouldn't surprise us in our own faithless nation that's turned their back on God that skepticism and unbelief would prevail. God has done a great work and arranged for the message to come to the king with good news and yet he still either can't believe or more, more likely simply won't believe. And I find that to be the case so many times when we're sharing the gospel. Because this is a great insight too on, hey, here we are. We have the good news of the gospel. More valuable than food and clothing and gold and silver. I mean, we have, we have come across something so more valuable. And yet, those of you, and you know who you are in your own personal walk with the Lord. Those of you that have not shared the gospel with some, someone, you can say like the leprous men, hey, what we're doing is not right. And you say, Ed, why? Well, because we've, we've got these great riches and we remain silent. We remain silent. And here the king, he's so filled with unbelief. And it's always tragic. It's always a tragic thing when unbelief steals away the blessings of God in your life and mine. It's always tragic. Oh, it's a trap. It couldn't be true. And our minds get filled with all sorts of weird thoughts, wrapped up in unbelief. Unbelief holds you back from all that God wants you to do. Unbelief leads to disobedience. Disobedience leads to more disobedience. Before you know it, you're, you're so far away. God has provided deliverance and abundance, peace, rest. God has worked and he's only met with unbelief. Notice verse 13. And one of his servants answered and said, Please, let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become all like the multitude of Israel that are left in it, or... Indeed, I say, they may become like all the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. But let's, let us send them and see. Let us see. Those are the words of faith. Let's go find out. Let's venture out in faith. Let's see what God has done. Let's see what God wants to do. Therefore, they took two chariots with horses, verse 14, and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army, saying, Go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan, and indeed all the road was full of garments and weapons which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians, and a seah of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel. And I have this underline, you might want to write it down, according to the word of the Lord. According to the word of the Lord. Now the king had appointed the officer on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. But the people trampled him in the gate and he died. Just as the man of God had said, who spoke when the king came down to him. So it happened just as the man of God had spoken to the king saying, two seahs of barley for a shekel, a seah of fine flour for a shekel shall be sold tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. Then that officer had answered the man of God, and said, now look, if the Lord would make windows of heaven, could such a thing be? And he, and he said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. And so it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. So the good news is, fortunately, the king still had a few people around him that were filled with faith. And that had the courage and the boldness to say, can we just check it out? Can we just check it out? Enough so that the king would respond, well, go ahead and go and see. And praise God for those of you here today that are filled with faith and speak forth faith in very faithless situations or to very faithless, skeptical people. And you come with great encouragement and you're always eager to find out what the Lord has, has done and what the Lord wants to do. And so as they check it out, indeed it is true, and everything comes to pass exactly as it was spoken by the man of God. But that officer got to see it and not experience it because he was trampled to death. Because the wages of his sin literally led to death. Let me read to you what one commentary uh, said in Warren Wiersbe. I love his commentary and I quote, he says, It appears that this officer had gradually accepted the pessimistic, unbelieving attitude of his king. To him it was impossible for the prices to fall that low in one day 
and for fine flour and barley to be available so quickly, but God did it. And the very people he thought would die of starvation came rushing out of the gate. They knocked him down and trod on his helpless body, and he died. The word, and this is where I like what he said, the word of the Lord lived on, but the man who denied that word was killed. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Listen as we head out today. Unbelief will rob you of the work and blessings of God. Unbelief will stifle the forward progress of your life in Christ. Unbelief will lead to backsliding, timidity, discouragement. Unbelief will hinder the work of God through a fellowship family. Unbelief will hinder the progress of your personal family. It will harm your marriage. When you don't believe the promises of God and you don't heed the promises of God, unbelief will pull you backwards. Because here we have the king, a man appointed in leadership by God himself, but he doesn't believe the word of the Lord. And we have his key man. He sees all this, but he's trampled to death before he could even enjoy it. The same thing happens today with so many in our fellowship, with so many around us in the body of Christ. You're actually seeing what others are experiencing, but because of your unbelief, you don't experience it, and you remain skeptical and maybe even hardened in your unbelief. And if you're not awakened in faith soon, your whole life will pass you by and you'll miss out on the abundance of life that's yours by faith in Jesus Christ. If that's one lesson we're learning and we're going to learn as we study through the life in the book of Hebrews and the life of these Jewish believers is faith brings progress. And we learn, well, it'll take us a while to get there, but in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, it is impossible to please God without faith. It's an impossible endeavor. And how important it is we need to match what God has said in his word with faithful obedience moving forward in the things of God. So Father, as we turn our hearts and attention towards you to ask you, God, to make this section of scripture come alive in our lives so that we might meet our unbelief with faith, our skepticism. God, send people into our life that speak forth the word of God, that that match, Lord, what they say with what your word says. Send into our life men and women of faith. Forgive us of the sin of unbelief, of skepticism, of trying to figure things out. And then when we can't figure things out, God, we get mad at you for not doing things the way we want them to be done. Forgive us, Lord, as a church family, as we've sinned against you in unbelief far more times than we both know and even admit, but rather fill us afresh tonight with an outpouring of your spirit of faith. God, answer the prayers of our hearts tonight that you might increase our faith. Every generation of believers faced this. Every generation of believers faced being met with the impossible, and instead of answering in faith, they answer in unbelief. And I even remember that time with the disciples where they asked you, Jesus, increase our faith. I remember you saying to Peter, I pray that your faith would not fail. I pray for those that are listening to us today that that their faith is failing, Lord. They're just so weak, so tired. Lord, they're just tempted to throw in the towel. They're tempted to respond in unbelief. It's just so hard to believe your word at times, Lord, that you're going to solve this problem, that you're going to move this mountain, (laughs) that you're going to part the sea. You just don't, don't know how it's going to happen at work. It's been so hard and so difficult. And just wondering which way to go. Because forward we see the Red Sea and it's impossible. And if I go to the left or to the right, it just seems like it's impossible. There are mountains and hills. And if I go backwards, I've got the Egyptian army chasing me. And I just pray for that man. I pray for that woman that just feels trapped right now. And they're looking for a way out. 
They're looking to the left and they're looking to the right and, and they're looking forward and they're looking behind them and in all of their mind they can't figure out a way out. They can't figure out what you want to do. When all the while, God, you have the solution waiting for them and you're ready to act on their behalf that they might just turn to you and not fret because of the evildoers. That they would trust in you tonight. They would commit their way to you. They would submit their lives to the Almighty God who has, uh, like, like we, we learned with Samuel, they've, he, you've led us this far. We set up that Ebenezer stone because you've led us thus far. And God, if you've led us thus far, you haven't led us this far just to drop us and turn your back upon us. But you have promised to finish what you've started in our lives, to complete it, to perfect that which uh, concerns us. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.